It's on now. Hallelujah. How's everybody doing? Fantastic. Are you sure about that? Okay. okay. Just, just double check. Double check. So the title of the message for today is Conquering Fear. We're going to look at a really awesome story here in 1 Samuel. If you guys have your Bibles or you want to... Uh, oh, yeah. We'd look at the screen there. So, First Samuel 17 says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and, Ez- and Ezekah in Ephes, Damim, <coughs> excuse me. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was about six cubits and a span. I looked that up, that's like nine foot nine inches tall. When I was off in Indiana, I had a kid come walking down the hallway, and you know, it ceilings is tall like this. Come walking down the hallway, and his head was like that close to the ceiling. I guess he was a basketball player. And I and he was. I asked him, "Well, how tall are you?" And he's like seven foot one. <laughs> seven foot one. Goliath was nine foot nine inches tall. Just to give you a little bit of a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Here's a. a He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was about 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then I will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You know, the story of David and Goliath has some similarities to us facing trials and difficulties. And I know that many of us, most likely all of us, are facing something of some sort. Some of our brothers and sisters are facing things a lot worse than others. And whatever that thing is, whether it be financial problems, health problems, whether it be employment problems, I don't know what it is, personal defects that you're facing. It could be like this giant here standing out in this field, and he's got something to say. He wants to say, you can't win. You can't beat me. You're not strong enough. You're not big enough. You're not going to make it. We cannot listen to the giant that's standing out in the field. Well, these guys who were all men of war, heard this nine-foot, nine-inch-tall giant come out there and say, bring out your best, I'll take him on. And everybody was quaking in their boots. Not really good day for the children of Israel. Now David was a son of, of an Ephraimite, of, <coughs> excuse me, can't catch my breath for some reason, of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. The man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented 
himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephod of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captains of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and all, and they, Saul and they all, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they had saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. And so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and will give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this matter, saying, It shall be, it shall, so it shall be for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, when he heard, when he heard, sorry, now Eliab, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your, insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. So I'm going to stop here and talk a little bit about where David came from. Because one chapter before this, and I would encourage you to go read it. This is a great story. Um, Samuel was sent by God down to Jesse's house because he was told by God that one of Jesse's sons would be anointed the next king of Israel. So Jesse gathered all his sons, except for David, who wasn't even counted or thought of as the possibility of this choice, left out in the field with the sheep, not thought to be material for what God was asking. And Samuel came into the house and saw, I believe it was Eliab, the oldest, and looked at him and thought in his heart, well, surely, surely this one's going to be the king. And God spoke to him and said, you know, you basically, ad-libbing, you look at the outside appearance, but I look at the heart. Now, you know, I don't know how many of you have been counted out. I mean, maybe you're even counting yourselves out, looking at what you're facing, trying to wonder how can I overcome the odds that are against me? How can I overhum overcome these health problems? How can I overcome the strongholds? that I can't seem to get away from in my life? How can I overcome fill in the blank, whatever it is? And I'll tell you, something was different about this young man from the rest of all of them. So when Samuel came, Jesse had all his sons pass before him. And he said, not that one, not that one, not that one, all the way to the end of them. And he's like, well, is this all your sons? And Jesse said, no, I got one son. He's the, the youngest. He's the one I didn't think of, basically. And he's out there taking care of the sheep. So Samuel says, we're not sitting down to eat until he comes here. And he brings David in. And Jesse takes a horn of oil and anoints David. And the Spirit of God came upon him, it said. That's a very important. Now, I want you to think about something. The Spirit of God came upon him. What do we have living inside of us? 
It's not just around us, and it is. He is all around us. He goes before us. He lives inside us. We're his dwelling place. The same strength that caused this little shepherd boy to rise up against a giant that we're going to read about here in a second, that strength lives inside of you. So I know that whatever that giant is standing outside in your backyard saying, come out here, I'm going to whoop your butt, sounds pretty scary, probably seems reasonable. I don't know everything that what you guys are dealing with, and I don't know what it feels like to stand in your shoes, but I know for myself and in my personal life, the things that I'm battling, and we've all gone through them time and time again, those things can seem enormous standing in front of us. We have to remember who's living inside of us. So we'll go ahead and continue here. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And then he turned from him and toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, for your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So something about Saul, when he was anointed king, he was like the tallest of all the people. He was a big boy. So now this little shepherd boy comes running up to him, scrawny youth, and basically says, no one needs to worry about a thing. I'll take on this guy. Can you imagine? So Saul is going to count him out too. First his father. Now King Saul. And Saul said to David, Are you not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him? For you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Have you ever encountered a bear before? I've seen them behind cages. I've never had one chase me down. I'd be running the other direction, by the way. Same with a lion. I've seen, I've seen a lion in a cage before when I was in the Philippines. Animal's huge. Kind of peed a little bit, shot like five feet. Like, and this guy, out in the field taking care of the sheep, God's preparing him for something. The Spirit of God is upon him. Can you imagine grabbing a lion by its beard to kill it? I couldn't. But David was sent to do that and get getting ready for this guy right here. I skipped him. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. There's the answer right there. There's the problem right there also. You see, when... I stand against my trial, when I stand against my difficulty, when I stand against whatever it is that's out there saying, you can't defeat me, I'm too big for you, and I start looking at it, and I just look at me, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm not like nothing, but sometimes those things seem pretty big, and on my own, I don't stand much chance. Let me tell you, it wasn't that long ago that I wasn't coming to church. I wasn't seeking God. I wasn't walking in righteousness or freedom. I was drinking beer and smoking pot. And you know what? That thing stood out in the field too. And it said, you'll never get free. You'll never get away from me. You can't overcome me. Look at the problems in your life. You keep coming back to me. I'm your master. Guess where that giant's at? Yeah, his head's on my wall. I got his sword too. He's definitely defeated. Why? Because I stopped trying to look at what can I do? How can I come and tackle this thing? And realized, guess what? I need help. And when I got humble and I said, I need help, God said, here I am. And guess what? 
nothing stands before my God. He doesn't stand before, nothing can stand before him in your presence either. If you call upon the Lord, he'll fight the battle. And the two of you together, there ain't nothing in your life that can't be defeated. There ain't no problem, no trial, whatever it is, fill in the blank, God's above it all. And so here's David, confident, not in himself. Man, if he looked at himself when he looked at that giant, he would have been like the rest of them, knees just chattering, like, no, get away. Let me get away from this guy. He is going to kill me if I get too close to him. But he was trusting God and looking at God. So here's Saul. This is funny. And Saul says to David, go and the Lord be with you. Good luck, buddy. And so Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I haven't tested them. So David took them off. Saul's armor was way too big. He was just walking on his coattails. And then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David, by his gods. That's a lowercase g, by the way. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camps of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." So it's pretty apparent to me that with the Spirit of God, there's boldness and strength in us. It's also very apparent to me that if we don't look to the Lord, we could end up like the rest of them. When I was reading through this, I could just feel the oomphta of the Lord as he's talking, man. He is very, very sure what's about to happen. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. So David overcame because he knew God. Not only that, but God had trained him and prepared him. And here's one thing to consider. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, And when you go through something and look back and see how God showed up, there's confidence being built. There's faith being grown. There's looking back at it and not feeling like it was a big deal anymore, but when you were in the middle of it, it was. And we could come up to the next thing that we're facing, and it's in our face, and it's trying to tell us we can't, and you're not going to make it, and how are you going to get through this? And we could forget all about everything that God has done in the past. Something to encourage you and to encourage me is to remember what God has done. How many awesome and powerful and wonderful miraculous things has happened in your life since you've known God? How many things have you seen defeated, problems overcome, defects eliminated in you, growth taken place in you since you've known God? 
there is nothing that is too big for him. We just have to remember he is with us. So we're going to jump ahead here to Matthew 14, 22 through 23. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he had sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Kind of sounds like Goliath there. Situation not looking too good. Have you ever been out to sea before? A little, I don't know how many have done it. I've gone charter fishing before. And those days when you go out, we used to do it once a year with the company I work for. Those days when you get to go out charter fishing and the, the sea is just mild and nice, you still get out there. And if you don't take motion sickness pills, you just rock and rock. And pretty soon some poor souls off the back of the boat. I've heard stories of when it gets really bad, close to them not wanting to go out at all, where everybody on the whole boat, motion sickness pills or not, is hanging over the side, chumming the waters the whole time because the waters are just way too boisterous. The wind is blowing. The waves are kicking their butt. Now imagine being in a little rowboat with a tiny sail and being out in the middle, and they didn't have life rafts. So these poor guys... They're out in the middle of the, the water here, and things aren't looking good. So now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, for they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. So you got the wind, and you got the waves, and all these guys in this boat are freaking out because they're about to drown. And here comes Jesus. Have you ever walked on water? I haven't because it's not possible. So Jesus comes out walking on the water. It dawned on me. You know, that, that ocean that was looking to swallow them up was the difficulty. It was the trial. Guess what? It was under his feet. It didn't overcome him. It didn't affect him. He wasn't even set aside by it. He came walking out, and here goes Peter. And Peter answered, or, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when, Jesus, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when Jesus saw, or when, the, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, saying, Lord, save me. So again, is it possible to walk on water? I mean, I, I don't know. This might be an opinion. I really, truly like to think that what Peter walked on was the word of God when Jesus said, come. Because right now, you know, if we stand off, stand out off the dock in the water, most of us are probably going to go swimming. So Peter gets out there, and he's looking to Jesus. And Jesus said he can do it. So he just pesters Peter. He just gets out there, and he starts walking out there. But pretty soon, he takes his eyes off of Jesus. He takes his eyes off of the one who said, you can do it, and starts looking at the circumstance. He starts looking at the health problems, and maybe it's the doctor's report. Maybe it's you're looking at your emotions and how you're feeling inside. Whatever it is, when we take our eyes off of Jesus and start looking at the problem, all of a sudden, the waves get big in our eyes. The wind gets big in our eyes. The problem gets way bigger than what's really in front of us, the one who has it all under his feet, and we're right there with him. So when we go through it, when we're right in the middle of it, we need to keep our hearts stayed on him. We need to have, what does it say in, in Colossians? Set your mind on the things above, not on the things below, because your life 
is hidden with Christ in God. So if you're with him and he's for you, what can be against you? So I know circumstances. I know feelings. I know problems. They're very real. They like to get very in our face, and the devil gets right behind him and says, nanny, nanny, boo-boo, how are you going to get out of this one? Guess what? Jesus defeated everything. It is all under his feet. You have nothing to be afraid of. Just keep your eyes on him, and don't forget. In 1 John 4, 17 and 19, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involved torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. When we know that we're his and that he is ours, when we're walking with God, it says right here that we have boldness. In that last day, we're not going to be afraid. We're not going to be troubled. I mean, if the worst thing that anything in this world could ever do to me is send me home to be with him forever, man, that's terrible. And not that I'm trying to go early, but hey, if I did have to go, at least I know I'm going where I'm supposed to be going, and it's not going to be a bad situation. If we remember that God is for us and that he loves us, and again, we keep our eyes on him, not in the trials, not in the doctor's reports, not in what my emotions or my flesh is screaming out, not on what it feels like. We have all the power. It says that the power inside of us is the same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, defeated death. We have what we need to overcome, but we need to remember whose we are, whose hand that we're in, and how small that mountain is in the sight of Jesus. Amen? Praise God. So, um, were you doing something after Okay. Um, I just want to invite anybody, if uh, anyone needs prayer right now, if anyone's going through stuff and feels like, I want to come up here and get prayed for, and we can get some guys up here to lay hands on you and anoint you. Am I missing some? Oh, huh. I got it all together, I promise. Oh, yeah. How can I forget? Man, the punchline. I completely forgot. Well, there you go. See, I don't have it all together. I was just making it look that way. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> Joshua. What's that? I'll stay on the line. <laughs> Lord, help me remember. Oh, hallelujah. The Lord uh, stuck this out to me when I was in the Philippines, and it really, really helped me because sometimes it gets scary over there, and not in the ways that you think. You should just try to go out on the meat market and Go buy a, some chicken. You'll be afraid. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written, written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Okay, yeah, that was a good punchline. Fantastic. So uh, if anybody would like to get prayed for, I'd like to invite you up. And is there any brothers that want to come up and help lay hands on these guys? And
Amen. Let's give Jeremy a hand. So as my brother was sharing in the very beginning, he was talking about uh, David and Samuel. And he made a really good point. I'm gonna, I want you all to go to Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. And I'm going to just read it to you if you don't have your Bibles. 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, and good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. For this is the one. Who's he talking about? Who's the Lord talking about? Thank you. David. So what did Samuel do? Then Samuel took, verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Now, so I, I believe our brother said something about, could you imagine being anointed and having the Holy Spirit come upon you? You know, back in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them like we believers do. Amen? Uh, I'm going to direct you to uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? Wow. Can you comprehend that? I mean, that's not new news. I know that you guys have heard this before and that you believe in this, but let's apprehend the meaning. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians. That's right, Ephesians chapter 1. Listen to this. Starting with verse 13. In him also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Is that not how we became saved? Did we not trust in Jesus Christ after we heard the word of truth? Amen? The gospel? And it goes on to say, the gospel of your salvation. In whom, after you've heard the gospel, did you believe? And this is talking to you. This is the process. In whom also, having believed, you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of, of what? Promise. Do you know, back in the day, the king had property? And he would send his property, sometimes by wagons or ships, by sea. And he had a signet ring. And he had a way of marking his property. And no one dared touch it. There was a, a wax seal that went around the crate. And the king would put his stamp, his signet ring, and make his seal on that box, on that crate. And no one better mess with that. Because if they do, they're messing with the king. Amen? So listen again. In whom also having believed, you were what? Sealed with what? A signet ring? No. The Holy Spirit of promise. Who? This Holy Spirit Listen to this. Who is the guarantee 
Do you understand that? That Holy Spirit that dwells within you, that Jeremy so proudly professed about having the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon you, he actually resides in all of us. And not only that, he's our guarantee of our inheritance until when? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Do you realize you have been purchased? You've been bought at a price? And as long as the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and since the Holy Spirit dwells in you, He's your guarantee. He's the, he's your, he, God's made a deposit. The deposit is the Holy Spirit. And this is, the reason why I bring this up is to serve as a reminder for all of us believers of the power in who we are in Christ. And how to walk in that power. And how to understand our calling. And some of you, I have your attention, and I appreciate it. Some of you others are just looking down and gazing and half, half awake. Okay, whatever. This is an amazing thing about our Christianity. And to understand and to call on it. I know you've heard it before, but have you grasped it? That's my challenge. Brother Oliver, come on up here. Bring him up here. My, uh, Deacon Miles, bring him up here. This is the reason why I'm bringing this up. I want you all to get inspired through the Holy Spirit that is dwelling within you, who is the deposit of your inheritance. You are a child of God. This is not our home. We are just passing through. We serve the God Most High. We have God dwelling within us. Let us believe and walk in that power. If you want to set that to the side, then go ahead. Guess what? I don't. I want to call on that power. And you know there's power in unity and oneness. If there's division or disagreement in our body, it affects the working of God. Now, I professed something when my brother came, that God was going to heal him, that he, he fulfilled part of that prophetic word when he walked up here. I guess I wasn't specific enough. Now, brother, I proclaim and, and prophetically declare that you will run up here without any, any assistance whatsoever. Do you agree? Amen. Do you believe God has that power? I know he does. And we're going to call it out right now, and we're going to believe together that our, this brother's got a heart. He's got a heart that's good. It's filled with the Spirit of God, and God wants to do something in his life. Don't overlook one another. Every one of us has equal value in the eyes of God. There's no one here, including myself, that's more special than anyone else in God's eyes. If you go to God with a resume, you know what he's going to do? That doesn't mean nothing to him. What means, what has value to God? Come on. What's in here? When we look at people and we listen to people, don't be looking at their out outward appearance. So God doesn't do that. He looks at our inward man. What's in our heart. And that's how we need to be trained to... Um, perceive our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a family, for crying out loud. We're together. We're not against each other. We're together. And we love one another. We care about one another. I will walk the extra mile. I will drive the extra 10 miles, whatever. 
I will pay the extra $100. Whatever it is that God has asked me to do, I'm going to do it because I love God and I love people. We, all of us, just like our Lord, are in the people business. Accept it. You're not in the self business. You're in the people business. If you call yourself a Christian. And, and not only are we in the people business, but we're equipped to perform in that function. Many of you have gifts. Many of you, the Holy Spirit has spoken and whispered to you. But you've refused the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Because you're thinking, it's my imagination, or what will everybody think? Who gives a rip? I'd rather be a fool for Christ than a fool of man. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> he says man's not the issue. So now, the reason why I'm building up to this is because I want you all to think about what I'm going to be doing right here, what God's going to be doing. We're going to lift our brother up in prayer. Amen. We're going to pray together in unity. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am amongst them also. I can feel a spirit. Okay. Cheryl? Don't jump. Come on up here. That's right. Women can pray. Women have the Holy Spirit within them too. Amen? Amen? Get up here, Lori. She's obedient. She's called, she texts me and says, I got a word, Pastor James. She gives me the word and wants me to take a look at it ahead of time. And she's got a heart. Leah, come on up here. Don't you jump. Come on, come up behind. Come up behind. I'm not done yet. Oliver, you just sit there and relax. There's nothing you are to do. Except to receive. You got it? Okay. Sister Deaconess, come on. Yes. That one right there. Nancy, come on. Sarah, come on. Is it Sue? Come on up here, Sue. We're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're gonna confound the wise. Okay, the ones that think that Christianity is just for men and they got all the power. Guess what? That's not true. You ladies love the Lord. You're His daughters, and you have power within you. And I want to lift you up to pray for our brother Oliver, who needs. He needs your prayers. And in faith, now put that down, please. Put that down. Jeremy, where is it? Okay. So, as I ask you to, ladies to pray, the bottle of oil is going to be passed around. And I would like you all to anoint our brother as we pray. Go ahead, Leah. You pray first. Just a minute. Uh, Doug? It's the white one. Oh, yeah. We oh, just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. All of you men, stretch your hands forward. Oh, Yahweh Elohim, we are acknowledging Just a minute. you. Just a minute, please. If there's anybody in here that doesn't have faith for God to heal, don't raise your hand. If you have faith for God to heal, then raise your hand. It worked. This is a prayer of faith right now. It's how God's directing us. Okay, go ahead, sweetheart. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, heavenly Father, 
oh, in your name, oh, hallelujah, oh, Yeshua HaMasihira, we come before you, acknowledging that apart from you, we are nothing and we can do nothing. But with this corporate anointing right now, in our midst right now, oh, God, we are declaring complete healing, oh, hallelujah, as I apply the blood of Yeshua HaMasihira from the crown of his head down to the tip of his toe. And every malfunction in his system will be normalized in the mighty name of Yeshua. Oh, hallelujah. I am declaring your word in Psalm 107, verse 20. You said that you already sent your word and you already healed him and deliver him from every destruction of the enemy. Oh, God, hallelujah. He is a, a, a purchased possession, oh, God. What by your blood in the mighty name of Yeshua, Hamasia, oh God, thank you for your healing touch, oh God. As we acknowledge your mighty and awesome presence moving right now in our midst, because that is your promise that when there are two or three people gather in your name, you are in the midst of them. Oh Yahweh, you are worthy to be praised right now, oh God. Thank you for your healing touch. Let him feel your touch right now. Now, in the name of Yeshua HaMasih, amen. Lord, we love Oliver. We lift him up to you. Father, cast your eyes upon him. Hear our prayers. Yes. Hear the prayers of your female servants, O oh God. Yes, Father, we thank you. We thank you for his life, Father God. We That's right. We thank you for your word. We thank you yes. for... For just being so faithful and merciful and compassionate, yes. God, and powerful. And Father God, your word says you are the great physician. Yes. For your word says you will not forsake us, God. Uh, and just, I just thank you for his life, Father God. I ask you to heal him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, Father God. Do a mighty work, God. We just love you and we believe you. Father God, you said if we have the faith as a mustard seed, God, and we tell this mountain to move and throw itself into the ocean, it shall do it. Father God, we stand here and we know you and we have that faith and we love you, God. We praise your holy name. We ask you to touch him from the inside out, Father God, that after today he would not, he would not be the same, that you would restore him. Restore him from the inside out, Father That's God, right. like a young eagle he will rise up, Father God. We just thank you for it. We thank you that you put every chemistry, every all his chemistry and every his organs, everything back into perfect condition because nothing is too hard for you, God. That's right. And all things are possible with you. And so we thank you and we praise your mighty name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I thank you so much that your word is true. That's right. And you've told us we are to become as little children. Yes. And Lord, I'm repeating back to you the things that you've already told us in your word, which yes. is truth. <coughs> you have told us that you will supply all of our needs yes. according to the riches we've received through Christ Jesus from yes. you, God. I thank you. And Lord, you have said that you have come to heal. And we are believing, Heavenly Father, that that's what you have for Oliver. Lord, and we thank you for his life. We thank you for who you are. You are glory, honor, and power you deserve, Lord, to have your son uh, believed on, on your name and what you can do in his life. We are coming as little children and believing you. You keep your promises, Lord. They are true, sure, yes. and amen. amen. And we thank you and we glorify your name that you have heard our prayer amen. and you answer. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Father God, we just come before you yes. in your mighty name. And we ask for your healing hand upon all of us. That's right. Oh God, just touch him. Yes. Touch him and heal him. Set him free in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we pray for those tumors that you would melt them like wax. Yes. So they will be no more in the name of Jesus. We command them to go in your name, Lord, because you are the great physician. You are the healer. And it is only in you that this will be done. And so we command it to be done in your name. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And we praise your holy name. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, you are the true Father. That's right. You are a good father. Daddy God, thank you, Lord. And you said, because he loved you, because we love you, Oliver loves you, yes. we love you. You said there's we nothing you wouldn't give cry, us if God. we ask. Faith. Faith in you is what pleases you when we earn to please you and to give you thanks and praise for all that you're about to do in Oliver's yes. life in our life yes. because your spirit is falling on the earth your Holy Spirit is falling on the earth like it hasn't before <laughs> and we're looking forward to serving you mm. and loving you more than anything Loving you, Father. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for the yes. love and faith Thank in you. you. <laughs> Through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be blessed. Oh, yeah. As long as he's okay with it. Okay. I'm going to do a little different, too. God keeps telling me I have to pour this oil on you. <laughs> and I will. <laughs> Father God, this oil He's about to get a shower, everyone. The Lord has told Sister Nancy that she needs to pour the oil on him. And Father, we just declare this oil represents the oil of the Holy Spirit. Father That's God. right. And Father... I'm going to do what you said, Lord God. I am just going to pour it over him. I am pouring it, Father God. You tell me, Lord. You tell me when to stop this, Lord. You tell me, Father God. You tell me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Oh, Father God, I just Hallelujah. want to thank you for your son, our brother. Father, I want to thank you for every word that has been spoken over him today, Lord God. Those words are powerful, Father. And I thank you that you have heard them, Lord God, and that they do move your hand, Lord. I thank you, Father, for that precious, powerful blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross mm -hmm. for your son. Yes, Lord. He shed that blood. He took those stripes for every sickness, every disease, everything that is not functioning according to the way you functioned it, Father God, those tribes are bringing it into alignment. Yes, Father God, every area of your son's body that is not functioning in the way you created it to function while he was still yet in his mother's womb and you have called him forth while he was in his mother's womb. And you have given him a purpose that you desire for him to fulfill for you in your kingdom. I say thank you for that, Father God, because you are faithful to see that happen. Father, you have brought him to that place of bowing his knee before you. That's right. And, Lord, we know that that means that we are declaring our obedience to you, Lord, to you. That means, Father God, we're telling you, take over our life in every area. That means, Lord God, that we're putting our whole trust in you, which you can and you want to do. So, Father God, you also tell us that if we ask, believing, not wavering, but Come standing on. strong, believing right. that you hear us and you will do what we ask That's and it's right. according to your will, that it is ours. Mm -hmm. So, Father God, this healing belongs to your son. 
because Father God, all glory to God, we believe for His healing. Mm -hmm. The Lord is saying, you do not look upon what you see your body being like now. Do not believe it. Do not rest in that. Do not receive that. But you declare that I am greater than what has been attacking your body. Amen. He says, allow my Holy Spirit to rise up within you yes. in power and in might. And you shall, I don't say you may be, possibly, I'm saying you shall be healed from this attack. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the privilege you have given us, Father God, to stand in the gap for him, Father Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your precious, powerful name. We thank you for your faithfulness, Father God. And as we reach out, you always answer. Always, always. Father, I thank you that this son of yours is going to be able to stand up. He's going to start walking. He's going to start leaping. He's going to start running and all of this because he is full of rejoicing for what and how you have touched his body. You will rise up and walk, my son. You will. Before our sister Cheryl prays. So I did a, a lesson, a teaching about public tongues. You just heard an example of public tongues. That word that came to us in tongues was interpreted by the speaker in a prophetic message to our brother for the comfort and edification of the church body. And I want to remind everyone, if you hear a tongue spoken, there's a gift called the interpretation of tongues, which you are invited to stand up and give the interpretation. But in this case, the speaker had the interpretation. Don't be praying in tongues if you don't have an interpretation or the Holy Spirit hasn't revealed to you there's someone here who has that gift. Because we don't want to speak in tongues to the ruin of the hearers. We want to build up and edify and comfort. So thank you, sister. That was a powerful word. I heard, I heard it. So when that's uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues equals prophecy. So that was a prophetic word. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're to test it to see if it's so. Amen. So just want to kind of give you an example because more and more the manifestation of the gifts are going to be experienced here in our services. So I want everyone to be on board and what's going on. Um, I, I know one thing. I felt the presence of God extremely strong with that prophetic word. So go ahead, Sister Sarah. Jesus. I anoint him with the Jesus on you oil. You are his possession. The one called Jesus. I call you according to Jeremiah 33. Call to me and I will answer. Jesus. I decree him healed in your name. I decree it in the bloodshed 
I claim the blood from the back side of the cross. The one called Jesus is in charge. You, you're reaching for him. You're reaching for him. Come closer. Come on. Come a little closer. Come a little closer. Jesus, just breathe on this life. <laughs> just breathe into those into that mind and touch him. Put one of e his two feet in those nail scarred hands. They could have kissed him, but they put nails in him. Today I ask you just to hold him. Hold one foot in each hand that he can walk in your footsteps. Just call him Jesus according to a purpose. But I decree above it all, your hand is upon his life. And I decree it in the name of Jesus. He is healed. He is healed by your power divine. There is none. Your fist is on the table. It could split the world in two. It's in charge of this life. It's in charge of it. I lift him up to your sacred nail scarred hands i love them so much in jesus name he is healed amen thank you thank you ladies let's give the holy spirit a hand amen Thank you, ladies. Ladies of faith, thank you. I know my brother thanks you. You were seven, okay. That's a God's number. Um, Oliver, how are you feeling right now? Do you have any words? Okay. Here you go. Thank each and every one of you. All I have in this world that means anything, that has any value, is God. Everything that I accomplish every day is through him. Every single thing. I was invited into this church and made part of the family. And you will never see me ever treat that like it has no value because it keeps everything. This family. Okay, we're misfits, but you know what? We're a family. We're a family of love and compassion. And it starts with that lady right there, and that man right there. He prophesied something a, few month, a week and two days ago that I would walk up front. I prayed about it. I've been praying about it. And God says, well, Oliver, you've got those crutches over there. And maybe that leg isn't listening to you, but you've got an engineering degree. Use it. That's where the shoelaces came in. Well, brother, those shoelaces and those crutches aren't going to do you any good next time because we're prophetically prophesying that you're going to be running up here. Amen. Amen. So let's give our brother a hand. Amen. <laughs> and so uh, thank you for, for letting us and letting God have his way in your life. And one thing I might want to add, um, you said something about um, having a gift through God. Okay. And God is your gift? Is that what you said? Okay, look out here. These people are your gift as well. You can add that to it because they all love you. Yes, they are. Amen. Brother Miles, you can go ahead and help him back. Amen. Amen. So, Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I bow before you. 
in a total submitted spirit, asking you to bless your people and to bless our brother, who is the object of the prayers we just offered up to you. We believe in you. We love you. And your word says when one suffers, we all suffer. And I ask you to consider my brother fully and completely. In Jesus' name, I, I pray. Amen. Um, 21 years ago, when God gave me and my brother Miles, and I shared the vision that God gave me with my brother Miles about having the Redwood Church of God. One of the things that he spoke to us about was people in wheelchairs. That he was going to move mightily and bring healing. And not just one wheelchair, but a whole row of them. So expect it to grow. And expect the healings to occur. Brother. One up here. Start over again. So uh, as he was just talking about that, I felt like I got to get up here and tell you what I saw when we were praying for Brother Oliver because I had a vision of Dee Dee coming out of her wheelchair back there and being astonished that she's walking and she comes skipping up here crying and screaming and freaking out and we're all flipping out because God's telling me there are no more wheelchairs going to be in this church anymore. So, <laughs> Just backing up what you're talking about. Amen. That's confirmation. Hallelujah. And so, um, uh, yes, I, I see a hand up. Come on up here, sister. You can come up here and speak. Are you just giving God glory? Okay. So that was your, your praising. All right. Um, one of the ladies touched on it. But I want to pray in a way that we can expect tangible results in all of her. And what I'm referring to, and this is being recorded, what I'm ref referred to is praying for his brain cancer, his brain tumor, the brain tumor that he's been diagnosed with. I want to specifically pray and I hope the doctors are watching or watch at some point because we're going to pray over our brother right now and please join in with me. Oh, so Father God, we lift up our brother Oliver. You are the God that healeth. As it was mentioned earlier, you are the great physician, greater than any physician that ever lived or ever breathed. It's you, Jesus. Yes. You are our Lord. You are our bridegroom. We are the bride. The church is your bride. And um, I want to specifically pray for, for about the healing of cancer in my brother. That's his current issue, is cancer. And I command it by the word of God. Cancer, dry up. And fade away in the name of Jesus so there's no trace of you in the name of Jesus. Shrink and shrivel and be blown away by the wind of the Holy Spirit. Complete 100% healing, never to return in the name of Jesus. Complete immunity against any kind of cancer in that physical body of Oliver Weaver. This is his day. His day for you, God, to complete a healing in him. We beseech you, O oh Father, hear our prayer. And we stand on the word of God that says, if we pray according to your will, it shall be done. We believe it is your will that you heal our brother and deliver him completely from all disease and sickness, in the mighty name of Jesus. By your stripes we are healed. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. You took it. You took it, Jesus. They ripped the flesh off your body for our healing. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, for you are the man God. There is no one like you. You're not a wimp. No, you were the man God. You took it all for your bride that you are so careful to watch over. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We can all say, Amen. Amen.